I, I remember when I left art college and I kind of, you know, w- went from this kind of community of, of, of people that supported each other and shared ideas and sort of spurred you on really and challenged you and everything. And then kind of you leave and then you, you go back to your bedroom. Yeah. <laughs> Creative people add a lot to, to towns and cities. It's very difficult, I think, for artists to kind of survive in isolation. Um, so I think, I think you know, it's a sort of shared studio space it is for any place that wants to call itself a city is, is, is really an important thing to have. This project is inspired by the closure of Portland Place, uh, which was a large shared studio space in the centre of Doncaster, just opposite the train station. Two organisations ran this building, so half was run by Portland Collective and then the other half was run by East Street Arts. And in total, around 40 artists used this space across a whole range of different disciplines. We got given our eviction notice in July of 2022 um, and we all kind of scrambled to find alternative studio spaces. Unfortunately, no alternative spaces were found so we've all kind of been dispersed into our bedrooms and spare rooms and kitchens. This film explores the need for more creative spaces in Doncaster. East Street Arts were really good at what they did. They found space, commercial space, and took care of all that business, tax, whatever, hoo-ha. And it was just a working space where we could be creative, it was safe, secure, clean, and it was super cheap. I think the first thing that it did was give us, obviously, that central hub, so everyone being dotted around Doncaster, everyone could just come to town, and it was close to the train station, it was close to the bus station, so that space, just location-wise, it meant a lot for us because people were easy. It's easier to get there than for them to come to my flat or to come to David's house. So um, that that was the first way it helped. The second way, it, it gave us just a, a space in town. Because obviously, anyone that's creative and Donnie, a lot of the work's going to be in town centre. But if you say if you have something in the morning and something in the night time, then you've got nowhere in between that space. And especially if you've not got much money, Portland were involved in the festivals, so we we converted areas as to turn them into art galleries. So they were quite heavily involved before they lost the space. When they lost the space, um, we started storing equipment and artworks for them. Um, but we also made the offer, you know, there's 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 spaces here you can use as a studio. Uh, and the the artists that took up the offer, artists like Ryan, have completely transformed the space over the summer. Um, it's, you know, there's a, a different feel to it. There's a different aesthetic. So it's, it really is relational. Um, it's not us doing them a favor. It's, it's a real quid, quid pro quo situation um, that I think would benefit a lot of spaces if people have room to give over to artists. A healthy uh, creative sector has a positive effect on the economy in general. It, business thrives when there's a healthy uh, creative industry sector. Um, and that's what we need a hub for that seeing all those different disciplines in one place yeah. mm. and I wasn't based there yeah. but talking to sculptors, visual artists of all kinds, musicians, mm. filmmakers, photographers, you realise what a, that sometimes the process, is, there's a lot of crossover in process yeah. and a lot of similarities with somebody you might think they, their output is completely different to mine mm. but how they get there might be similar. You know we are so culturally vibrant um, but there's not a massive awareness of that. Um, and I don't think there's a massive appreciation for the industry and the, you know, creatively in the sector. Um, so I think there's lots of issues why things aren't necessarily accessible. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's about us attempting to connect those dots and come together as not singular communities, but a whole network. Um. It seems much more, I, I, I feel it's much more uh, vig- uh, sort of vibrant now. Uh, there's, I seem to be a lot, more, I'm aware of a lot more people kind of making art, a lot more people engaged in arts. Um, it, I think it has a much higher profile than it than it had previously. Uh, and I think people understand that the power of it to transform places and lives, which I, I think pre- perhaps when I first started out, people didn't really appreciate that. So, you know, it can be used for sort of th- therapeutic reasons or... Um, you know, social reasons, and 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 I think 
not it's not just artists but it's also kind of local authorities you know the, the work you know the nhs for example they start they've started to understand that that role that arts has to play this place is like the beating heart of the lgbt community in doncaster like we all knew we needed it but we didn't know how much until we opened doors um it's a lifeline um people come in here and it's like um the family home the social club um, they get to see art. It's opened up a world of stuff to them, as it has for us. Like, we've got to meet all these wonderful people. And for me, it's like, I'd lose my job, like, first and foremost. But, for yeah, for, like, I could see the decline in people, the mental health, having something so, like, like beautiful taken away from you. It would destroy people's lives. Like, you... Yeah. Sometimes there are groups of people that, that will just meet here. It's the only place they want to come and meet. Um, so that isolation, straight away. You know, friendships drift, friendships fade when you don't see each other. I'll try and sit in a cafe, but if I've got a meeting or something, like there's no guarantee that uh, someone's not going to come in and say something. There's going to be like a loud clatter in the background or anything like that. It's very like... Or that your Wi-Fi is even going to work. Yeah, exactly. It can get really patchy and it's just a, a pain, so I'd rather work at home. There's a lot of artists just working from back rooms and sheds and things like that. Nobody's Nobody knows they exist because they're not pushing themselves. They're not promoting it themselves. And I think all these empty shops, they only need a few, don't they? The current space I use is basically my living room. Um, I have my own little corner in the room where I've got plug so sockets for technology if I'm doing digital art or I'll bring all my paints and stencils in here but it is a shared space and it isn't always the best to work in. I need proper space mainly to store my art because even in between finishing it and when it's finished I need a safe place to put it where I know it isn't gonna get sat on by the animals or destroyed by something because it has before. And it really sucks, but the only thing you can say is, well, I don't, I didn't have a proper place to store it. What am I going to say? It's a tricky one to answer because I think if we got a little bit more funding year round where I could focus on bug light a bit more when we don't have the money, I would love to be in a space um, where I'm around other people who are doing similar things and to be able to feed off them and you know, that kind of thing. Cast, I think if I asked them, if I said, can I come and work in your office? I'm sure they'd let me, but... I don't know that that's at the moment very beneficial because I sort of have to work around work. So I'll do my job and then I'll come home and write a funding bid at 10 o'clock in the evening. Do you know what I mean? So it's um, it's probably not where we are now, but I think I'd really like to expand that community engagement and we're never going to do that without a space. But then that's catch 22 that we need the money before we get the space anyway. Um, for example, if you were here, and you had a space inquiry, you would be put through to our administrator. And then if it was specifically about a arts development project, you would be put through to our associate, um, associate producer, Katie, who would then have that conversation with you. And then it, it would either be that there'd be a cost, it might be a subsidised cost, it might be that we felt that we were going to donate that costing that space in kind, that, um, or it could be that we'd work together on a funding bid. So that's how it would work with this organisation. People come in and will almost say, "Well, I don't feel like um, I," um, which is a terrible thing to say. But people say, oh, "I don't feel I'm like really worthy of this space because it feels too nice. It feels too, too good." And and. That really upsets me. That makes me really, really sad. And then once people have come for a few weeks, they kind of make, they, they'll they say, a lot of people say, you know, I, I, this is my second home. A lot of people say to me, feels like my second home. Um, whenever the four walls get a little bit too much, I know that if I just jump on a bus and I get to the point, I can stay as long as I want. There's no kind of pressure to buy anything or take part in anything. Yeah, I think, yeah, if you have a space and there's availability there, you need to push it into as many communities as possible, not just these are the creative people I know or these are the people that got the finger on the pulse or whatever. Like you need to actively get out there um, and tell people about it, especially I feel like um, young people need to be targeted with it because you know, going into um, like education provisions and letting them know about spaces that are available to them because um, 
like I say, I had no idea about anywhere, really. It's only recently that I've known about them. And I wouldn't know how to go about getting in them, just because I know they're there. Like, you know, I wouldn't know how to set up getting a space, do I have to pay for the space? When can I use the space? Like, I wouldn't know any of that. And it's a bit intimidating. Um, for us, it definitely the way that we did it with East Street Arts was just renting that space because it meant, like, some, day, some nights we'd be there till three in the morning, some days I'd come, I'd be there for two hours and then leave. Um, so that, that flexibility, as well as it being accessible, I think the flexibility of it being yours, um, whether it's whether it's in club like um, a collaborative space with other organisations is fine, but I think having that um, that round the clock twenty four hour accessibility is important. So there's obviously lots of kind of there is lots of empty space, uh, and I think that's fairly a similar situation on, on most high streets at the moment. Um, so my hometown is a town called Rugby in the Midlands, and it's a really similar situation. You walk through the town centre and most things have been outsourced to kind of industrial estates rather than being in the town centre. Um, but there are some really great examples of where um, using kind of empty spaces really creatively has been really beneficial. And whether that's just been kind of dressing buildings. So um, pre-pandemic, we did that with some spaces in Waterdale. Um, so we were able to kind of dress them so that they were kind of caught people's eyes so they were kind of we didn't have to be in there all the time we were just able to use the windows um as exhibition space and that was brilliant um it kind of got us a, a passing traffic that we would never normally get when we were at the old checker roads museum site um and then there's a the really good examples of kind of how the art bomb shop is kind of used i'd walked past the unitarian church courtyard a few times mm. and been curious because it's a sort of beautiful little spot and I went in there and we just sat under the cherry tree, which is still there, and had our sandwiches. And Brigitte came out and started chatting to us and invited us into the church to show us around. And then when the pandemic started, um, we did birdsong mm. and made the case that the, some of the Doncaster Creates funding would be diverted towards doing commissions for artists to make a response to the pandemic. Um, and then I'd started talking about doing a small, modest pop-up festival, Art Bomb. And they sort of came together. Um, Sasha curated an exhibition, which you were part of. Um, and then we built, very, we did our first sort of proper Art Bomb festival. Um, I did a deal with, the church and got them some money to buy out the entire building. Um, and then the, the, the people that said they wanted to move in there, um, initially that was Chris, Doncopolitan and Ruth and um, Sam. They pay rent, not a lot of rent, but they pay a rental directly to the church. And it's enough money, basically, to contribute to the utilities and a, um, you know, council tax, even though that's on a charity rate. Doncaster's creative scene is rapidly growing. There are more creative professionals working here than ever before. However, their needs aren't being met within the city. We do have an emergent artist community that are really cohesive and really interested in collaborating with each other regardless of there not being a space. Yeah. Now I think that having a space can only like strengthen what is already there and I feel like for, for, we've touched on it already but for new people wanting to to enter into the creative industries and not really knowing where to start it can provide a point of point of call of going okay well it's not a theatre so you don't have to worry about being like well I'm not a performer yeah. and it's not a gallery so you don't have to be like oh I'm not really a painter I don't really want to go to the library you know it's just a neutral working space for creative people and so you know that you're going to meet photographers producers theatre makers artists dancers like whatever coming in and doing whether it's their administrative work or workshops or whatever um, that space allows I suppose 
You know, ideally, I'd want a space with lots of different artists. So, because when I when I when I first started my career, I worked for Doncaster Arts, and one of the, one of the things that really stands out to me now is a lot of projects happen in the cafe at night. Yeah, that's you'd be having a coffee, or you'd be having a drink, or you'd be in the pub, or whatever, and somebody go, "Oh, I'm thinking about this." You go, oh, "Have you tried this?" And then before you know it, you were writing an arts council bid. Yeah, I think when you are a freelancer, um, suddenly you've got all these hats that completely take you. Because like suddenly you're the social media manager, you're also the business manager, you're also the admin assistant. You've oh, yeah. got all these things. Yeah, it's all these things that you've just got to start doing. And you end up not actually being able to have any time to do the thing that you're supposed to be doing, which is the thing that you care about and is your passion and is your, your sort of vocation, I guess. Um, because you're trying to figure out which like TikTok sound is going to get you further, like it's just a pain in the ass. And I think being able to have access to you know other people that can do that stuff for you or can explain to you how you can do that stuff or like how to balance all of those things, I think that's really important as well. Mm. I mean, every major city has a creative hub, so for there to be nothing provided for Doncaster to create and to document history and how people are thinking and what we're going through, um, I think is a loss. It's that space for innovation and that space for, uh, it's, that, it's that time. So like that might sound crazy to the council, give us five years of a building, but no, that's what we need, yeah. you know, that we need to be given that autonomy of time and that process of yeah. how the brain works and like creativity yeah. works for innovation because we could make amazing things happen. Yeah. One of our aims for this study was to create more transparency around the power that the local authority have when accessing these unused spaces in Doncaster. Everything's being used. There's a building over here that we want that is a, the old forklift truck training centre. Um, perfect for an artist um, and we could you know, extend what we do at Bentley Urban Farm. It is storing uh, exhibitions from Cusworth Hall. So all of the major buildings, Copley House would be a fantastic one. Um, they're mostly used for storage. The old museum, again, storage. You know, it's, it's a crazy situation. What you one of the challenges that, that we face as a council and ultimately extends to the artistic community is that we don't have uh, the stock of buildings that we that we used to have and we all know the story we all know why we know the narrative we've, we you know we've been forced into a position where we've had to you know re re get rid of a lot of assets that previously you know may have lent themselves to to be to be used for such spaces and I think that so we have got to look to the private sector. I think there's probably a role for us as a council to try and underpin that, you know, whether, whether it be not necessarily as a guarantor, but as a, a, a kind of partner organisation that, that, you know, brings some stability to it. Because it's no good as constantly finding buildings or you finding buildings that, that you're there for 12 months and then we find ourselves in, in this constant cycle. We need, we, need a, we need to find a permanent home. I mean, we, we represent heritage in its sort of broadest, in its broadest sense, really. So I suppose it's part of our, our our business to kind of you know lobby for heritage and culture, um, and to and to support things that that will benefit those areas, um, which in turn benefit the the, the life of the town. Um, but I don't personally have any particular power to to um. Um, you know, access access disused buildings or anything. So, um, so even though I work for the local authority, it's not the same team. So um, there are there are still loads of barriers in working out who owns what. Um, so in the past, we have tended to use unused space in the French Gate Centre because it was kind of easier to navigate talking to Karen at the French Gate, <laughs> um, essentially. So um, I think one of the kind of main barriers is kind of knowing who to talk to and knowing what is available. The whole point of Rat right Pass Street and getting access to an empty shop unit in the high street is that we increase our visibility and our understanding um, of, of who we are and our place within the community. But similarly, it was about having a space that we could offer out for free to help enable people to deliver workshop activities from. So we were recently looking for a space. We wanted to do some recording. Um, Cass were booked up 
Um, and we, again, we wanted a space that people felt comfortable going into. Um, over the years, we've built up lots of, lots of contacts in the town centre. Um, and we approached Frenchgate, uh, and they offered us a space for free. Again, you know, Frenchgate are massively supportive, I find, of the cultural sector. They do have some empty shop units, not lots, but they do have some of a smaller size. Um, and I've always found them really supportive with the delivery of events because they recognise, I think, that additional cultural um, activity brings audiences and in turn brings shoppers and people that will spend money. Um, so from that perspective, I, I think um, Frenchgate are a useful asset. Similarly, the markets team, um, again, they've been hugely supportive of, of us um, Doncaster Minster. None of these people have ever asked us for any money for the venues that we use. How do we map what the artist need is to what's available and then make those connections is probably, and that's probably where I can help. We have those spaces where we can connect and, and allow people to have those informal connections. I know you're doing great things with the wool market and they've been really supportive over the recent light, light festival because they see the benefits of both both culturally and commercially being really candid but even then I was there Sunday evening in the Walmart not everything was open you've got all these I mean you, we were sold out on the corn exchange fronts people get a coffee and I'm like so frustrated at this point in that the experience of the art was fantastic the wraparound then and this is not at anybody's door it, it fell over a little bit and if we're yeah. trying to create this experience we need all of those things landing so, but go back to what I do, I can help people, I guess is the thing. The conversation about space needs to also extend beyond city centre locations in order to be truly inclusive and accessible. The Fox Gallery, I registered it in April and I am already working behind the scenes on a creative hub, which will be film, which will be music, which will be performing arts, which will be art gallery which will be a literacy. The importance of Mexico at the moment now is to make it feel like it is part of Doncaster because over the years um, it has had its connections under the Dern Valley Councils which takes it over to the Barnsley area, it's had its connections to Rotherham, it's had its connections to Doncaster where now as Doncaster take ownership of it and help support it to become this new town what it needs and I think arts is another thing what will help support that. Doncaster is about to launch a new arts and culture strategy with a degree of fuss and fanfare and I think that's a brilliant thing it's you know when we started the advocacy for the sector five years ago that's the, the kind of outcome we wanted to you know commitment we're going to take this stuff seriously but it has to come with an implementation strategy and it has to come with some resource and if we do think this is massively important to the success of our communities and economy then there does need to be that seed corn it's how we got city status we treated it like a campaign it's how we built a university technical college we treated it like a campaign you know we've worked back from the end we wanted and we've got a brilliant new learning institution that's you know twofold oversubscribed you know, so maybe if we're thinking about the value of creativity to our economy we need to be on a bit more of a campaign footing with it I think bringing all those small networks together to create like an, um, an infrastructure is really needed and I think that will take some business sense. I mean, I think, I mean, I remember going back into the late 1970s, early 80s, that there's an area of Nottingham um, called Hockley, which is just sort of just outside the city centre, which was very kind of run down and sort of semi-derelict, really. And I suppose um, something called the Midland Arts Centre opened up down there, which was a which was basically a gallery space with studios attached, and it it sort of started a transformation of that that part of the city, and it and it's now and it still is. Although the, the art centre is now gone, it that Hockley still is now kind of a trendy part to go to. You know, nice coffee shops and interesting sort of um, alternative retailers, that sort of thing. Like uh, the art house in Wakefield's a really good example of creative workspaces. You know, the DMC in DMC two in Barnsley are really good, good examples, although they're digital focused. I think the challenge we have uh, here is the, there won't be a, a space that fits all. I think there's absolutely a need for artist spaces. I think there always has been a need for artist spaces for us. Like the Portland Place East Street Arts model is really interesting because East, East Street Arts have that in Leeds, but you know the transient nature of it is it was always going to be temporary. Yeah. You know and and if we buy into that temporary nature of it, 
it's always going to be constant upheaval and moving around, and which I think is, is more counterproductive. Chris Perkins is a local printmaker who runs Print Imperials and hosts a variety of workshops aimed at young people of Doncaster. We met with him at his brand new venue down Waterdale. Over in Park we're going to have screen printing. Oh, um, so that's going to be a facility we're going to be able to burn screens for people and like teach people how to print. How does it feel? Um, signing a three-year contract because I know like for me that would give me a lot of anxiety. Work backwards, work backwards, see where you're going to be in five years. So this space is uh, owned by Lazarus and uh, what happened is I went to a meeting, um, it didn't kind of pan out but then AD from council uh, said look does this space I know, do you want to have a look at it? I said yeah, I had a look at it. I said yeah, <laughs> and then um, that was a Friday, and on the Monday I signed a three-year lease. Sometimes it's like connecting the dots yeah. of who to speak to because, like, you can like go and approach someone, and then they'll lead you to someone else, and then <laughs> you'll figure out how they're connected and who they work for and what they do. And yeah, it's like just figuring that out is sometimes a bit of a puzzle. Not even as asking for things, but explaining what benefit you're going to bring to a situation. Every time you've got to think, I've got to bring something to this situation, whether it's somebody who needs the place fill in because it's like a, um, a better situation for getting rent or whatever it might be. And I think having some offers for businesses and sort of being clear about, you know, different, different ways that they can, artists and businesses can connect. Um, and maybe there's a role for the Chamber of Commerce in that. Um, to, you know, going back to the four or five years, you know, people are used to organisations like Chambers of Commerce making the policy case for more infrastructure, you know, better rail links, more roads to join up our assets. You know, that's the kind of stuff you expect to, a grown up sounding organisation like a chamber to do on behalf of employers in the area, you know. And quite rightly, we make noise about those things. We you know we push quite hard on um delivering the skills our economy needs. So it's sort of demand led, not supply led. But equally, we want to live in a cool, fun, happy place as well. And arts and creativity plays a, a massive role in that livable city. It contributes a lot to the economy, but it also can act as a magnet to those skilled people that our employers need to drive their um, commercial success. So going back a few years, we made a, a lot about the sector. We've put skin in the game too you know I, I commit a lot in a voluntary capacity as, as trustee of um cast theater you know i've got a colleague laura sat in the room who's a um, big part of friends of the grand you know it's stuff that we, we live and breathe because you know we're either residents or near neighbors of the uh, of the city too and we want to see it sort of <laughs> thriving so we see a role for ourselves championing that sector but i think we now need to move beyond just the sort of esoteric yes it's important stuff to building those day-to-day relationships that we have with other employers in the area where we're offering practical help and guidance. Do we need us locally then as part of our emerging cultural strategy, a cultural map, city centre master plan that is focused on assets? Because you're quite right, because if you go down Scott Lane, you've got right to Cross Street, you've got Chinwe, you've got um, the, the, the gallery. We did have Kim's, which that little cluster, and it, it does lend itself because what what this is only my take on it. We don't want people having to wander everywhere to find all of the, the artists or the shop, the, you know, the shops, I say shops loosely, but that sort of shop front. So is that something that working with Business Doncaster work is to say, right, okay, where is there a, a street or something that can become the cultural beating heart? And then we've got the civic quarter, the cultural quarter, but it doesn't really lend itself because those, you know, by the Savoy, that's going to be massive rents, massive anchor tenants. I mean, it would be amazing, wouldn't it, in that glass front and all that sort of stuff. It's, OK, Waterdale is going to be the new, because it's connected to the cultural quarter. All of these units there will become artist spaces. What do we do with existing tenants? All of those sort of things. And I think it's, it's having that longer term master plan that says it's not going to happen in two months, three months, but no. by 2025... This area will be a thriving cultural heart with all of the artists located here.
Creating a longer term plan that serves the creative community and raises the profile of Doncaster is what is needed. But understanding what the artists need from these spaces is vital if they are to be utilised fully. I mean, even if it was a case of somewhere with big tables, you know, like when you go into college, you've got those big tables. You can go, you can lay lay some artwork out if you want to. Even if it was somewhere like that, it just it, it just needs space, doesn't it? You, somewhere with a lot of space, big tables, accessibility. There's also a range of things you can have depending on the artist. So again, booking a room would be good because not everyone paints if you need a room to just record a song or clay. You could also, could you not as well book a room if you're doing um, workshops? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So if you just needed a room every Thursday for a few hours. I like the thing with here as well is as wonderful and as beautiful as it is, and we can churn stuff out night after night. We're also talking about maybe starting to do things in the day when it's closed, um, not put the bar on, um, just things for the community. But the fact that there's pumps and there's bottles, the fact it's a pub, that can be triggering enough for some people. So I'd like spaces that aren't alcohol reliant for the LGBTQIA community. Things where um, like we can get some, some young people in, some, some queer youth in, because they're right, they're right, they can come here and play pool, eat crisps till six o'clock, um, but it's not great. You know, they need to be given space to like grow, learn about themselves, learn about like queer history, you know, learn about me. <laughs> and they're not, there's not that, that opportunity to do that here. Like we're doing everything that we can. Because all these places kind of have like a, a, a close off time, mm. I guess, like art exactly. bomb. They, someone's got a key and someone has to lock that up. Yeah. Detail on, they have a shut off time. But at Portland, there was always someone there. Yeah. You could get there at 2 a.m. Someone's in this, you know, yeah. doing something. People have different times. I work, in, I work at like two and three o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know, mm. in the day I'm distracted because it's sunshiny and there's people around. I, I'm distracted by you people. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> so that's what I'm going to do. So good Wi-Fi, comfortable, mm -hmm. different options of, of set up. So whether that's, for me, whether that's like clear desk. Clear desk is so important. Whether it's flip chart, whiteboard, like somewhere to map out. I would happily pay monthly for that. Yeah. Absolutely. Because it's like, it's going to be so much cheaper than having to like book one tiny room for yourself. Where you can barely do anything in it. Yeah. Because all people want to do is like, they take a place <laughs> that's like, a place that's just like dead space that no one's using and they, you know, they give it a lick of paint and a new carpet and go, there's your space. Yeah. Like if we have an organisation that is a membership thing that we all sign up and go, well, X amount of your membership, £2, £10, £5, whatever, yeah goes to an administrator. So the more members, the, the more administrative time you have, or whatever that is. The potential of Doncaster, if we pull together, is huge. There, there's nowhere else, you know, geographically, ecologically, and creatively quite like it. And we need to celebrate that, that and not try to emulate another town. You know, the offer is, is quite unique. And um, we need to, you know, sell the USP, but also raise the bar when it comes to quality and things. It is clear that there is a need for more creative collaboration in order to make Doncaster a thriving, vibrant city. And that the responsibility to have more creative spaces and artist visibility in Doncaster is shared. This means a joint approach between local creatives, council, businesses and organisations in order to build something with longevity and sustainability.